This is Capsule on LiveInLimbo.com. My name is Sean Chen. And I am Andreas Fabiolakis. This is an adventure into music, film, and pop culture. How are you, Andreas? I'm pretty good, thank you. How are you? I'm pretty good, but I guess we're all a little, I guess, shocked, upset, and saddened by the news of the death of Robin Williams. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Obviously, at this point, it's not news. I think within like 10 minutes, it wasn't news. I think the entire world was aware of what happened immediately. It was a very quick and universal response, actually. I th- Okay, well, from what I recall from that moment, like I heard nothing about this. And then I was on Twitter just checking out the feeds. Then I see one. I think the very first one that I saw was from Variety. And I was like, what? That's a relatively reliable source. And I tried to Google it too, but nothing was popping up yet. So I was hesitant to post it. But then I guess since it's variety, right? So then I ended up posting it. And then all the other news outlets started, not because of me, but like, I guess in general, like it started spreading quickly. And then I see everyone else on Facebook and Twitter starting to post it. It's like... Yeah, I was pretty devastated by that. He was one of my favorite childhood comic actors, if you can call them that. I think everyone was skeptical at first because um, it wasn't like it was like a car accident or something or he'd be battling cancer for a while and everyone knew it. Uh, It was very vague at first. No one even knew that he had depression, not like... um, Obviously, his family and close one and close... uh, loved ones and all of that did but none of us knew really um he talked about it here and there but never as like a severe thing he's been going through at at this point in time and i just remember that there were like three articles i think that were out when i was trying to find one uh because i heard from you and i wanted to look into it because it could have been fake and everything was vague it was all these articles were saying um like two sentences robin williams is dead exactly um he died in his home of asphyxiation. We'll get back to you. And yeah, it took me about 10 minutes to decide if I should post it or not, or share it with other people. So. Yeah. Well, once more people started giving out more information and more was more research was done and the actual family came out, that's when everyone knew obviously. But yeah. at first it was so vague and you see this thing so often where a lot of actors will even reply to their own deaths apparently where it's like, Oh yeah, I've died. Yep. <laughs> like Peter Steele, for instance, uh, the singer for Typo Negative. I remember there was a big hoax like ten years ago when it somebody posted like a grave a gravestone after the band had been around for a while. Um, yeah, and it had his name on it, but the P in his name was covered by an R or by by a rose, I think. Um, and it made it look like a different letter, like an R or something, and. He was like, this isn't me. This is Eater Steel. That's not me. But then when he actually did pass away, a lot of people thought that was a joke. They're like, oh, here we go again. But no, he actually did die. So yeah, it's it's, a crying wolf thing. It's not even just that. It's just even if this hasn't happened before, it's hard to take anything immediately um, when it comes to that. Especially in this age of social media and like instant news, right? You have to look into things carefully. But yeah, so... He's still relatively young. He died at the age of 63. And the way that he died is, I think, the biggest hit for everyone because um, especially with mental health issues finally being discussed um, in the media and even in film, like Silver Linings Playbook, for instance, is a pretty good perspective on um, how mental health issues actually work. Um with a lot of this actually being talked about and obviously with these films being made and the actors within these films starting to actually talk about it, like Jennifer Lawrence was a great ambassador for, um, for mental health issues while it was award season for um, that year. Um, something like this, it's a really big, heavy hit because it's sadly, it's something that's like an example where it's like, here you are. Um, here's what we've been talking about in the in a great big example right um yeah we're all still waking up like in society we're still waking up to this issue of mental illness and mental health problems 
And then you see what Fox has done, which luckily not a lot of news sources did what they did. But did you see what they did? No. What happened? Uh, one of the reporters for Fox basically called him a coward. Wow. I guess luckily that's like the only negative thing I've seen so well, far. Well, I think um, ABC also had one. I don't know if you saw that on Twitter, but um, one of their headlines was um, the privacy the, thing. Yeah, right? the privacy. The the family. In like in the actual article, in a quote from the family, said it said they um, wish to have their privacy until the, they want to speak out further. And yet they have this aerial shot of like a helicopter over their house. And it's not even just that. They actually promised footage where it's like, click here for yeah, non-stop footage. Clickbait, right? That's what they want. They all want uh, the clicks. Yeah, it's terrible. Well, luckily, his daughter, Zelda Williams, actually has come out publicly. Um, so that could at least be put to rest. Uh, but and she came out with a, with a really nice statement. But um, still, initially, it's like, give well, the guy. Yeah. What, what are you going to achieve? What are you going to see? People walking in and out of a house? There's nothing you're going to see. You're not going to see his body or it's anything. Even- societies want for instant news, no matter what it is. But back to what you were saying about Fox, like, I yeah. think that's kind of the general immediate thought people have on people that commit suicide is, oh, he quit. He he gave up. What a what a loser. Like Luckily, um with this instance, that's usually the case, obviously. But luckily with this instance and the fact that it's finally being talked about and discussed publicly, um it wasn't as bad. A lot of people were actually understood fully and a lot of people who've dealt with depression actually saw one hundred percent why this happened. And um, what they're saying is that a lot of uh, mental health helplines or just psychiatrists have gotten a huge boom within the past few days because a lot of people – I've actually seen a lot of people on Facebook myself um, actually coming out and saying, no, this is enough. This is a big wake-up call. I've got this. I've got that. I've got um, depression. I've got anxiety disorder. Um, and because of that, all of these psychiatrists and helplines are – had like a big boom because uh i th- it's um I, it's this one quote that's being passed around actually where uh i can't remember the exact quote but um this guy goes to the doctor and he says doctor i'm really upset and depressed and the doctor says well you you shouldn't be you'll be fine the great clown has come into town right and the guy says but doctor you don't understand i am the great clown and a lot of people are attributing that to Robin Williams because um, who would have known that this guy was depressed when he was our reason to not be depressed, right? Right. He made millions of people laugh and enjoy themselves, and we would have never known that he himself was not happy. Yeah. Something I saw on either Reddit or MG, I don't know if the user came up with it, but if they did, it's pretty clever. Um Robin Williams was sadly the only person on this earth who didn't experience Robin Williams. Yeah. And, um, it's not just saying, oh, he didn't have somebody like him to laugh at. It's a way, it's a clever way of saying that he never understood truly who he was as an effective person because he was being eaten away at by this disease known as depression. And that's the sad thing about this illness. It, it really changes your perceptions of everything. And One thing that one of my friends mentioned to me was that her parents, who are elderly, like in that generation, when they heard about this news, they told her to not say he commits suicide and just say he had a heart attack or something like that internally and within their immediate family. It's like there's something that's really I guess that generation is still in that that box, right? They can't, they don't want to, I guess, embrace or acknowledge that suicide is like an actual thing. A lot of people... It's a very well, taboo subject still. Yeah, I, I believe it's... Especially if you're like religious. Yeah, um, it's weird because... Uh, actually, I did a thesis. Um, I did two theses. One of them was on how mental illness is represented in film aesthetically through sound and vision. Um, yeah, for instance, like Silver Lining Playbook, when the camera would get a little bit fuzzy, for instance, right? Um, and be- because of this thesis, I actually do a lot of research on how mental illness was perceived o- over the years. And at first, it was treated basically the same way homosexuality was, where 
uh, if you said you were gay or if you said you had um, some illness of some sort, they just throw you in the bin basically and basically leave you in there until you changed or until you were quote unquote cured. Um, and with all of these changes in society where all of these, as you said, taboo subjects are no, lo- no, no longer taboo, but they're actually being seen for what they truly are. Um, it's nice to see that mental illness is actually being looked at as a severe um, problem, which it actually is because uh, no longer can you just say, oh, you're sad, just cheer up, put on a good movie. No, it's a, it's a serious thing that damages people pretty much entire lives. And it's, it's actually a really scary thing. It uh, is very scary. But yeah, as you said, uh, older generations, because of the fact that um, I think when I did my thesis, the earliest film I could think of that really kind of made mental illness not like a vice that a villain would have or a trope that a goofier character would have um, was something like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. You know what I mean? Where that was even in the 70s. So before then, like it was seen as like a twist ending where he somebody would wake up in a mental ward and the entire movie was yeah. fake, right? Wow. It wasn't treated as a serious thing or something that you know and any person could have, and um, that's in the seventies. So you can only imagine the earlier generations and their isn't uh, uh, from from what I recall, wouldn't like the earliest like mainstream film be um, "It's a Wonderful Life"? Oh, with his depression, yeah. Um, at the same time, it's used as a. I think that's the first time, like as a kid, for me when I like saw that. It's still used as a as a plot device. You know what I mean? Where it's like this person's depressed. This is why this happens, right? And while it doesn't really poke fun at it or anything, it didn't treat it as something. You know what I mean? Normal. Where, yeah. for instance, with homosexuality coming into uh, the media you found a lot of people kind of getting angry with stuff like will and grace where it's like well we're glad that you're showing homosexuality in a positive light but not everyone's like this some of us aren't like we just want to be treated as normal you know what i mean so if you saw stuff like the wire and six feet under where um he had homosexual characters but that they weren't like the homosexual token character right they were just normal people they just they just happen to be gay and they also happen to like this and that and you know they would play cards or you know it was just an aspect of them that was a real person and it was difficult to find that with mental illness as well for many years um and even though one foot over the cuckoo's nest you'll find like this person's got this attribution this person's like this right um it blurred the lines a little bit because you kind of got over the fact that this that these people had these illnesses rather quickly you got to see them as real people in their environment so yeah um it's pretty difficult to find movies now that still do that right exactly for me two of my favorite films that he was in was jumanji and i will always remember him for the voice of the genie in aladdin when i made my list sorry keep going yeah so yeah so yeah i was gonna say that's my two those are my two favorite films of his that he was in and you did a a very nice touching feature of his five best moments in film on live and limbo the link will be in the show notes yeah and yeah um basically why i didn't include the genie um i think his genie is terrific and obviously one of the best parts of the movie um and i love the fact that uh he's actually the merchant at the very beginning that's his voice as well right yes yeah so there's a big uh theory that the entire movie didn't actually happen it's just the merchant trying to sell something um which if you look at it that way, it's kind of beautiful because the genie is his way of kind of like straying off the story because he kind of gets into it too much. Right. That's why he brings in all these modern references and stuff. Right. Um, you know, there's a lot of theories about that. But nonetheless, the fact that Robin Williams is essentially the storyteller within the story and outside of the story, I think is a perfect fit. Why I didn't include it, though, is because um, while that is something that he does really well, I find that. The moments that I picked, you got to see his actual facial features and his reactions to um, situations that I felt like most of his talent came from how natural he was and just like how his eyes would react to situations. Yeah. And that's uh, the his role as the genie is a very, very close. Um, uh, what's the word? Honorary I, mention. There we go. I guess you want you chose the film that he was like physically represented in. 
Yeah, and that's not to say that an animation, an animated film, doesn't bring out the best in a person. But like I said, um, you got to see his natural reactions through his emotions and his uh, and his expressions within these live action films. So that's why Aladdin will be an honorary mention. But I I stick with the films that I picked. So do you want to just quickly name off the five films that you put in the list, and then our re- yep. our listeners can read it for themselves. Absolutely. Uh, number five is Awakenings. Number four is Good Morning Vietnam. Number three is uh, Dead Poets Society. Number two is Good Will Hunting. And number one is an incredibly underrated film, The Fisher King. Yeah. I actually really like Dead Poets Society. So, yeah. I think everyone does. It's, yeah. it's one of those typical Oscar uplifting movies, but it's a damn good one. Exactly. That's the thing. It's exactly. a damn good one. Yes. So if you live in Ontario and you're suffering from, or you think you're suffering from mental illness or depression, you can please call the mental helpline at 1-866-531-266 or www.mentalhealthline, wait, mentalhealthhelpline.ca. Or if you are friends in the US or the rest of Canada, you can visit suicidepreventionlifeline.org. And there's also um, the suicide helpline, which I've read off a subway, actually, a subway ad. It's uh, 416-408-4357. You can call any of these. Just make sure you talk to someone. Yeah. Uh, And actually, if you contact these, a lot of the time they say if, um, if it's an actual emergency, like you're on the brink of wanting to commit suicide they advise you to immediately call 911 or to go to the nearest hospital and um yeah so if that's the case um then i i highly suggest you follow those orders because it's a again it's a very serious matter that's um finally being taken seriously now but the right precautions should be taken NME, the big UK music publication, named Radiohead the most influential band today. What are your thoughts, Andreas? I I have nothing against that at all. I think that's pretty spot on. You know what? A lot of my friends have been messaging me and they're like, no, I don't agree with that. But you know what? From what I see, they are the only band from the 80s or the late 80s that are still creating critically acclaimed music that is relevant today, like such as in integrating electronica while still maintaining rock elements. Mm-hmm. And they are more than just evolving because each of their albums sounds very different from the other, yet they're still better than the previous most of the time. Well, and who would they mo- say otherwise? And most of the top 10 are still very like suitable contenders as well it's very hard for anyone to put a list like this together so i Uh, think radiohead is a great representation of music like the most influential musical people today oh absolutely do you actually have the top 10 in front of you yeah so well the top 10 is uh number 10 is the xx number nine is nick cave who we saw which was cool yep uh six was the flaming lips 
five of the strokes. Four is the white stripes. I don't know why they're actually there because they're not functional right now. Oh, that's not the... Uh, keep going. No, we'll talk about them afterwards. Three is Kanye West. And number two is David Bowie. And one, yeah, is Radiohead. And then there's number eight, Kate Bush. And number seven, the Gun Gun Club. Um, yeah, I don't okay. know why I skipped them. <laughs> no worries. Um, I'm looking at the entire list now. And this kind of changes things a lot. Um, so the way you said it, uh, the most influential today or whatever... Uh, it felt like they were bands that were kind of playing now, which kind of makes sense because David Bowie just released um, a comeback album. But I'm looking at it as a whole. It's as a history, names, right? Like, yeah, the Velvet Underground, My Bloody Valentine. But wait, why wouldn't course. they? Why wouldn't they just call, say, Jack White? If, uh, as opposed to just White Stripes, yeah, because the White Stripes. Uh, I guess yeah, they elevated him, right? Not even just that they came they came first out of anything that he's done, and it was that kind of punch that a lot of people wanted to cup to copy that sound that he created right um but what was that song again with like the Lego blocks that was our first oh one. fell in love with the yeah, girl. Yeah, 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 yeah that was a great one yeah they've had a lot of great songs actually, and i I agree with them being on the list entirely. I'm oh, just yeah, looking at this entire list, but it's it's pretty bizarre because it's very it, hard to put a put together a list like this you, sh- you should know since you did that before oh yeah absolutely but um i j- it just doesn't if this is history then they're, ma- they're they're missing a lot of really big names but um i guess what it's, about beethoven and people like them they're not on it <laughs> well this is contemporary music so they rarely are i, I think um but fair fair enough point i understand that exact like entirely but um i'm just looking at this because the velvet underground are here which they haven't performed in a very very long time they haven't made an album since the 70s and um if you're talking about the music that's being changed today by even like the older bands or whatever then we're the beatles yeah exactly hmm that's very interesting yeah uh, so not I, even just the Beatles, but the Beach Boys, even and uh, the girl groups back then, the Rolling Stones. Yeah, how can the Beatles not be on here? Was o- Oasis on there either? I don't think so. Uh, knowing NME, they probably were. I'm trying to have a look. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but if, if, even if you bring it all the way back to the top ten, yeah. I think Radiohead is the most influential by a significant portion. Right now, anyways, I agree. I think actually, well, Kanye West, I think he could have been actually two, maybe. Kanye West is highly influential. Here's the biggest thing. Yes, the guy's a jerk. And yes, he said a lot of things that are bad. And no, not everyone should like his music. But if anybody just keeps hitting and hitting and hitting hip hop in different ways and disparate aspects, breaking the genre into different forms and piecing them radically to, like together again, whilst making it mainstream... Of course, that's the one catch. Making it mainstream and marketable, it's Kanye West. I would have actually ranked it number one, Radiohead, two, Kanye West, three, Jack White, four, David Bowie. Flaming Lips could actually be higher, I think. Flaming Lips are terrific. And um, the fact that they're collaborating with so many musicians alone, like the new album with the new project they've created called Electric Worm, uh, the fact that they're collaborating with their peers and the people that they've influenced, I think that says enough. The fact that all these people are like their disciples almost. Why do you think Radiohead is the most influential band? Well, they basically did what Kanye West has done now. But first of all, they did it before he did it. Exactly. Um, the, the near career suicide numbers of times without actually going overboard and losing what they are in the first place. Um, they did that, but with a much more difficult genre because hip hop, hip hop's a, a huge fan base. Um, it's still on the radio. Now you have a lot of people who are kind of willing to listen, except for Yeezus that kind of turned off a lot of people, even though it's an exceptional album, um, critically acclaimed, but a lot of fans weren't really getting it. Um, I think, well, in hip hop, people kind of expect them to change sounds but not so much in rock like 
Radiohead yeah. went from like classic rock of the bends into like in rainbows and king of limbs like techno rock yeah. well, and they did it successfully well absolutely and uh they have so many different styles on each album i mean you still have the the difference with Kanye West is is that he's got obviously different styles on each album but you can hear people who've been influenced on each and every single album radiohead are almost too far ahead of their time sometimes like there's still people trying to achieve, like achieve what OK Computer did. Nobody's achieved what Kid A's done so far. No, like at all. Nobody's even come close. Uh, have people even really tried? I don't even I, know. I don't even think they tried to do that. Like just OK Q- OK Computer alone is still enough of a source material for people, and that's that's saying something. That, like that, yeah, huge. that's like why they're the most influential. All these bands today source from. They can source from any one of those different albums, and they're all so very different that there's a plethora of material to take from. Yeah, and and they're still relying on the first few albums of theirs, right? They haven't even reached Kid A yet, or even in Rainbows, and that's a lot more accessible, and that's more recent. What What is your favorite Radiohead album? Um, In order, I No, just always... one. Choose one. Oh, Kid A, absolutely. Yeah. Um. I really like In Rainbows as well, Amnesiac, uh, OK Computer, I guess, and it's the band. It's such bends. a hard choice. I can't. They're okay. Admittedly, they are my favorite band. I cannot choose a favorite album. But if I really, really, really had to, by like zero point zero zero one percent, I would say In Rainbows. Even though I do love all the other ones, In Rainbows is pretty damn stellar actually my favorite song of uh that album which is actually my favorite song of the last decade is all Reckon- i need oh reckoner yeah <laughs> i love absolutely reckoner, reckoner. um i i think like by a huge insurmountable lead that's the best song of the past decade me too just phenomenal the fact that they could incorporate so many different um melodies with different instruments even like all the percussive instruments kind of carrying on their own kind of melody and rhythm um and then like the vocal melody is just so unique and um the drum pattern is just so off kilter but stable at the same time it's really difficult to play actually yep i haven't tried. seen anyone pull tried. it up perfectly <laughs> no i i've looked up youtube videos nobody's pulled, or pulled it up perfectly yet it's maybe really... you have to try it out then i used to play drums uh i kind of like air drum to it have you seen I... them live I haven't, no. Oh, we got to fix that one day. They're supposed to be making a new album soon, so maybe they'll start touring like in a year or two. Yeah, that's what they were saying. Um, I just hope they come back to Toronto after that tragedy. Yeah, they should. Um, Well, that wasn't Toronto's fault. That was just the weather's fault. So I don't think that's going to deter them at all. I was supposed to go to that one too. Actually, I was too. (laughs) I, I saw them in 2009 at the Molson canadian amphitheater that was oh my god yeah when they played right that was for the in rainbows tour i remember yep. standing there right at the very front i lined up at 11 a.m and when they played reckoner i felt like it was bliss that's their best song i've gotta i've gotta say that's what i feel is their best song that's what you're you would like pay and die to feel that experience yeah that song alone even reckoner uh-huh. live, yeah and that's just, when they had that that kind of um, the lighting, like, you know, like the, it was almost like rain. Yeah. Yeah, that stage setup was great. All right, moving on. Spotify finally comes to Canada. So I was able to get a pre-launch invite code for Spotify, which is uh, one of the most popular, I think it is the popular um uh, music streaming service in the world that has 40 million users and 10 million paid subscribers worldwide and so i was able to get into that this morning and i sent you uh andreas um an invite as well so you're one of the first few beta testers absolutely and thank you again for that and so you had some time to play around with it and what what is your like experience because this is your first I guess, real music streaming service. 
Um, they've kind of nipped every demographic in the bud. And uh, I say this because I remember when you were offering me the invite, I was saying, okay, I don't really stream music that often. I buy a lot of albums. I prefer physical. Um, but thank you. Anyway, something else would be better off with the invite. But for people like me, who are clearly like... I had to pop your cherry. <laughs> um, people like me who, who clearly... Uh, are too invested into music. Um, they've got us by the throat as well because they have the, they have the ability to kind of share playlists as if you're like hosting your own radio show almost, exactly. right? Yes, and that that's what caught my attention. And um, just looking around, I haven't really taken it full advantage of it yet. But just looking around the phone app, actually, I've, I've got it on Android now. It's pretty well designed. Um, very accessible for all kinds of music listeners if you just want something at the gym or if you're somebody like me who's obsessed with finding things that are really obscure and um like you just hit yeah. search and you ter- yeah. type it in and boom you have whatever you want right there in front of you yeah, you don't really need to crazy. go to your collection and pull out a vinyl or a cd and pop it into your computer it's accessible oh. uh, well i love putting vinyl on my computer it's the best um yeah but no. it's so much faster uh i think the joke went over your head but anyways <laughs> um no i said i was gonna put a record on my computer but oh yeah yeah <laughs> no i'm of course i'm still gonna listen to my record collection but i'm definitely gonna take advantage of the piecing together of playlists because i love doing that anyways so i used i th- if you're if, if you've been listening to this podcast for like even like a few episodes you'll know that i'm a a fan of streaming music legally yeah i yep. use rdo that's also both of them are 9.99 a month which is a reasonable affordable price for unlimited access to music legally i support musicians that i like so this is one way to do it so rdo was great well mainly because it was the only one that was available in canada finally after all these years spotify is here but i like the new dark user interface of spotify they focus largely on the social aspect of sharing these playlists and as an audiophile i love the option to stream at their extreme or uh, 320 kilobytes per second quality RDO only allowed us to do, they never actually official, officially told us what they streamed it at, but people have tested it and it's only 128, no, 192 kilobytes per second. So this is almost double. Wow, that's a big increase. So yes, you'll use up more bandwidth. I'm fine with that. I have good data plans, but I want that quality. And this gives me that, op- you have the option. You have like low, medium, and this 320. Yeah, so you can't really go wrong. No, and I love it. The font is great. Everything's great. It's pretty great so far. All right, and this week you also had the awesome opportunity to head down to the Last Gang headquarters in Toronto Yep. to interview the new pornographers. Absolutely. I got a chance to talk to Catherine and um, Carl of the New Pornographers, and it was an absolute privilege. Wait, so for, before that, how was the Last Gang headquarters? Oh, it was stunning. Uh, we weren't allowed to take pictures or take any video footage of most of the room. Actually, we were we were stuck on one wall that we could use. Um, Did they say why? Why is that? Uh, I don't think they want uh, all of their Junos and much music awards and golden albums, platinum albums, <laughs> all of those huge accolades um, being shown to the world. I think that's... Oh, uh, why not? Um, I'm not really sure. It was the personal preference of uh, the person whose office we were using. Okay, to that's shoot. good. Yeah. yeah, so fair enough. It's okay, their maybe personal give us um, an audio description of their headquarters then, as soon as you walk into the lobby. Is there a receptionist? Um, yeah, and uh, it's the lobby is kind of connected into like the main offices. Uh, there's just a lot of desks, a lot of pictures and things going around, personalized desks. And then we go down to like the very end of the hallway or like the end of the room, I guess, with all the offices where the room we went to was because it was a lot more quiet there. And um, as soon as you open the door, you, you're just stunned by all of these gold and platinum <laughs> albums like i saw everything from britney spears to drake to metric um 
what else? I can't even remember some 41, like all of these. And you know, you've seen what these are like before where it's not just the album there, but they do like a big presentation with all the cover art and everything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like for the face on, um, I believe the album is called live it out for metric. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was like the, that face of the cover art kind of repeated three times around this massive um, award. And it had like the big title underneath in like fancy, like colorful letters. It was really cool, like all of these presentations. And I really wanted to take a picture. But of course, um, if it's at yeah, somebody's... Yeah, you have to respect them. Yeah, I feel if it's somebody feels that it's at, at their expense that this is being revealed to the world, I don't want to be that person to ruin it for, for them. Yeah. Well, at least um, you'll always remember it in your head. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, I was talking to Carl Newman about the Juno Awards. Um, actually, when we were done filming, we were talking and uh, I was like, oh, it's a shame we couldn't use this wall or whatever. And he said, actually, I've I've noticed those Juno Awards. And he went up to go play with them, I guess, and was saying these ones are different sizes. Um, this one's bigger than, than the other one. And it was just a very surreal moment that such an such a privileged and um, achieved musician of our time. Like the new pornographers are no laughing matter. They've gotten a lot of accolades themselves. Um, like best albums of the decade from Pitchfork or one of the best albums anyways. Um, one of the best albums of Canadian music history. One of the best indie albums. You know what I mean? Like they've, they've been recognized before. Exactly, but to see yeah. like the fact that he was astonished by all of these Junos <laughs> himself, it was, it, it was surreal and both of them were really nice actually and the fact that they were just as shocked as i was with all of these like awards everywhere it was humbling yeah well we're really grateful that they allowed us into their home in toronto yeah. and you can um actually so we're going to do something unique where they actually want to be on the podcast but we did a video version as well so you can find that video version with on the handsome Andreas. Oh, and, yeah, sure. And um, that will be on our YouTube channel, Live on Limbo TV. And you can find the link in the show notes. Yep. And you will hear the audio version for the podcast right now. Hi, I'm Catherine Calder. And I'm AC Newman. We're from the New Pornographers. And you're listening to Capsule on Live in Limbo. This is Live in Limbo. I'm Andreas Babiolakis, and with me we have members of New Pornographers, Catherine and Carl. How are you? Hi. I'm good. Very excited as we were just talking about your new album, World Bruisers. Uh-huh. That's been going pretty well so far. With yeah. The new single getting great reception. Yeah, it's it's more uh, it's more a great reception, and in Canada particularly, we've uh, gotten more radio than we've ever gotten on anything else before. So that's cool. We never expect to be on the radio. <laughs> but that's surprising because some of your albums have been considered some of the best indie albums, some of the best in Canadian music history. You've got mentioned on Pitchfork's Best of the Decade list. Mm-hmm. And this is only now that you're reaching this kind of plateau. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know. You kind of reached the best and you're going even better somehow. <laughs> that's, the, that's the hope, you know. I, 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 I mean, personally, I feel like I'm, I'm always learning. Uh, with this new album, um, you say you pick things up along the way and you learn new things, and that's your approach to music as opposed to having like a set mind. Mm-hmm. Um, what did you learn from this new album, or did you learn anything before this new album that helped you kind of bring it into fruition? I don't know. It's um, I know we must have learned something, but it's just so much of it is winging it. So much of it is just like putting your head down and working and and when you hit it, you go, yes, that's it. And I don't really go in. We go into it with the vaguest, just the vaguest idea. Like, let's sound like that Sig Sig Sputnik song, or let's sound like Xanadu, or let's sound like Johnny and Mary by Robert Palmer. Yeah. And then other than that, th- th- they're just vague. Those are just like vague touchstones. And we're never even trying that hard to sound like that. We just... That's just currently what we're into. It's just a song we're currently obsessed with, right. and we, we we just we just start going. Uh, so I I don't know what I've learned, but I hope I've learned something. <laughs> it seems like you have, because again, you've got all these accolades, and um, you're reaching this 
uh, popularity level even now. So it seems like you're still on the right path. Um, you say that you kind of just wing it within uh, the music creativity that you have. Um, does that mean that you have like a lot of fine tuning within the studio, or does that are you kind of comfortable with the first instinct and the first few tries that you have? Sometimes, sometimes you um, a song locks in immediately. Um, a lot of the time, you know, you, you start playing it, and you think this is okay, but you know, you're looking for that pixie dust. Yeah, you're like like. Well, I feel like with with each song in this record, like I wanted every song to have its own specific personality. Because sometimes when I'm writing a song, it just feels like a bunch of words and chords. And I think I don't want it to sound like a bunch of words and chords. I want it to sound like this very specific entity that's very unique. And and sometimes you find that immediately, and sometimes you should search for it, and sometimes you don't find it, and the record just gets knocked off the record. Yeah, because you just didn't find a specific voice you wanted, but it's um, yeah, it's like I said, it's very, it's very much winging it. I wish there, I wish there was a formula. If I could find the formula, I would put out like five albums a year. I would be spewing this stuff out. But then your stuff might be too calculated. It might ruin the magic of the pornographers. Right? It might, but maybe it'd be more popular. I need the formula. Well, you're reaching popularity now, so maybe you've maybe you've hit it now, right? May- maybe. I feel like it. Um, I, I, I feel like we hit on this record. We hit something closer to what I've always wanted this to sound like. Oh yeah. Do you still feel that there's a bit of a distance to that sound you wanted to always achieve, or is this close enough where you feel comfortable with um, what, you've, what you've achieved with Pro Bruisers? I think it's pretty close. Pretty close. But but at the same time, uh, I feel I feel really good about this record. But and. It was fun to make, and it just makes me want to make another one. Yeah, it just makes me think like this. This record came off really well, so I should do another one. You know, maybe I can do it again. Exactly. Anything in the woodworks at this point, or is it way too soon for that? And no, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I've been writing a lot of songs, but I mean, we'll see. I, I want to try. I want to try and start demoing songs. Yeah. And there's still songs from this record that we haven't finished that I wouldn't mind finishing or reworking just for like an EP because they're you can always do stuff you know you can always do more stuff yeah uh it's and and there are songs that because they were from these sessions I would never want to push them to the next record right because maybe nobody else feels that way but to me I feel like no this song is from this time so it should come it should come out at the same time absolutely uh, and we were just told that you were filming a music video yesterday, last mm-hmm. night, I believe. Are you able to talk about that, or is that, like, top-secret stuff that we can't go into? It's, I guess we're not supposed to talk about it yet. All right. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, we don't even know what it's going to look like. But it should look cool. But it should look good. Okay. Yeah, the director is Scott Cutmore, who's done some fucked-up videos. I'll have to say fucked up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's good. Well, well, it's the name of the band, right? Up videos. Yes. It's the name of the band. There yeah. you go. So then you have every every right to. Yeah, yeah. He yeah he's done some cool fucked up videos. He did a great uh, video for Mets that we really liked. Cool. Um, and he's done others, of course. But yeah, he's very cool. That should be a interesting video. Should be good. Um, with the new album coming out on the twenty fifth, um, do you have a lot that you have planned? like tour date wise or even like music video wise like do you have a lot of that kind of in blueprint or is that again something that you kind of win and see we'll what see. happens yeah I don't I don't know if there's going to be any more I hope there's more videos because it's fun to make videos unfortunately they're not the cheapest thing to make no mm-hmm. so hopefully the we can get some more grants to do another one or find somebody who will make a video very cheaply um yeah well, I mean we have a lot of, we have are touring pretty much booked through the end of the year. I mean, we're, we're just doing festivals for the next couple of months. And beginning of October, we start our main tour, and that's for about six weeks or something. And that ends at the end of November, and we're um, the first 10 days of December, we're going to Europe. Oh, wow. And then, yeah, we get back, and we might do some more touring in January. I don't know. I just want to get. I just want to get through that. Yeah. We'll see. Mm-hmm. I, I, have, I have a. I have a strange relationship with touring, and it's a great thing to do, and uh, and I love it. But 
you know, I currently don't want to be away from home that much. It's a kid. Oh, yeah? I don't, don't want to be, he's two and a half, and I don't want to be the absentee father. No, oh, yeah, I understand, 100%. There's so, a good balance, I think, you can strike. Yeah. You know, you can be a bit, when the band is in the position that we are, you can be a bit choosier about what you want to do and what you don't want to do and boundaries. You know, I think when you're a younger band, you kind of just have to take every opportunity. Yeah. Or at least that's how you feel. You're young, you have a lot of energy, you don't care if you're away from home, it doesn't matter. There's no significant others to, to kind of work around or, you know, it's more. It's a little bit more free. Um I don't know what my point is, except that it's good. <laughs> Maybe it's conducive to, more conducive to family life stuff. Well, I don't know. Well, one great thing is, it's like, uh, <laughs> the the good and bad side of it is like, when when I'm there, when I'm not there, I'm not there at all. Yeah. You know, but when I'm there, I'm absolutely there. Mm-hmm. So it's nice that, you know, the, you know, so far, it's like for the first two and a half years of his life, I've been there like most of the time. Right. And I think I'm, I'm lucky that, like, you know, I guess a lot of kids don't have their parents there, like, you know, nearly full time for them. So that's, that's been nice. And that's been part of being a musician. So now, so now I'm approaching on, like, the other side of it where, like, yeah, I have to leave you for, you know, five yeah. or six weeks. Yeah. Or even weeks. That's not so bad, then. It's not, yeah. Out of those months, it's not, it's not so bad. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think I'll get through it. Mm-hmm. They all get through it. <laughs> it should be fine. It's tricky though because um, New Pornographers have been around for uh, since the late '90s, and um, obviously it's still an integral part of both of your lives. Um, you joined in 2005, I believe, mm-hmm. right? Um, so ten years, over ten years on your end, um, it's still a massive part of both of your lives. But now that you've got these um, other aspects of your life, these new chapters entering. Um, do you see new pornography still going on for a while, or is that something that you think you could balance pretty easily, or do you think it's something that you feel might kind of um, be something that you want to put to rest a little bit? Do you think it, this band's going to go on for a while, or I, you know, I think it will. I mean, mainly because I personally, I just, I just love like it's just like a plat. It's just this amazing platform. Yeah. Like, I, like I want to make music, and like I've been blessed with this amazing platform where like it can make music and like people want to hear it yes yes and we do. so and it's it's and it's even like going i'm sort of known as a solo artist but a lot less so you know yeah like i can take the same song and it's worth so much more it's a new pornographer song that it is one of my solo songs which maybe doesn't <laughs> maybe it sounds way too pragmatic but and, and and I feel like this band has always been sort of part time. I don't know. We'll see. I mean, I could even see at some point the band just eventually morphing into a studio project where we just don't play that much. Right. It's not it's not that different from what it is right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do take your time because it was four years since the last album. Yeah. Which is good because if quality over quantity, one hundred percent, and. Um, as you said, it seems like it's something that uh, doesn't take up all of your time. It feels a little bit like a side project almost, but it's not. But it's a super group in, in a sense of the word, where a lot of people come from various projects and amalgamated to one. So do you find that that's kind of the success to the band? Not necessarily all these different ideas, but the fact that you have a lot of time apart, and, and then when you have time together, all this creativity flows? Yeah, I think there might be something to that. Yeah, and, and yeah, we, we have a lot of time apart, so it's like, there's not a, you know, it's not yeah. that weird thing where you can't stand each other. Right, exactly. Where, like, I, th- I think there's a lot of bands that are just, like, pretending to like each other, you know, for, for the public, and we absolutely love each other. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't make a record like that. You can't make a record when you can't stand each other. I don't Rose's believe <laughs> what Guns N' Roses try. Yeah, you can try. You can try to do it, but it will always come across that there's something, and maybe, and maybe like there's the occasional record that where that happened and it was a great thing. But I find that I find it hard to believe because I, I mean it, it must be rare because mm-hmm. it, you know you need to be in close quarters. You can't be fighting. It's distracting. Yeah. You know if you're 
if you're having arguments with people all the yeah. time or there's a lot of tension, it's just distracting. So how can you possibly focus on what's going on in the music and how could anybody have an honest opinion or an honest relationship with the music when there's all this other nonsense going on? So that's not, that's luckily, <laughs> luckily not, not what's going on. So. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the key to the new product for success because, again, you've had all these accolades and you have this huge following for this new album, World Bruisers, which is out on the 25th, I believe. Yes. It's coming out a day earlier, right? Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people are waiting in anticipation for this album. There's a huge hype behind it. So, um, that's good. I guess that's the key to success. No fighting. Um, <laughs> kind of winging it. Good balance. Exactly, good balance. Yeah, winging, slight wing. Just all the humane kind of aspects of what music can be and not all the systematic kind of elements. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you for joining me. It was an absolute privilege. And you can listen to Girl Boosters when it's out on the 25th. And I'm with Carl and Catherine, the new pornographers. Again, it's been an absolute privilege. And thank you so much for this. Some Easter eggs uh, about this lovely interview. It didn't go so smoothly. Um, when I when I met both of them, I talked to them directly. I said, oh, hello, Carl Newman. Hello, Catherine Calder. And right as soon as I was about to start the actual interview, um, I guess because I was just so blown away by all of the awards and everything. And I've never done an interview or even been in like such an important area within the film industry. Uh, so I got a little bit nervous. And... I you got nervous? A little bit. Yeah. And um, I was introducing them during the beginning. This is Live in Limbo. I'm Andreas. And with me, I have Karen and Carl. And she says, no, my name is Catherine. And I was just, I was so flummoxed the entire interview. I was so upset with myself. Um, but she was fine. She didn't seem too upset, I don't think. Hopefully. Uh, she was like, don't even worry about it. It's, it's fine. <laughs> she told uh, you that after or she stopped you right there? Oh, no, like she wasn't like angry or anything. She just nicely said, oh, sorry, it's it's Catherine. And oh, I said, oh, my, my goodness. Yeah. I was like, but I, I said, Catherine, when I saw you and like, you yeah. know, I know what your name is. I just screwed up. I'm so sorry. And um, everything was fine. But still, I mean, uh, just just to throw it out there that th these things don't always go smoothly. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. So I guess did you do a few retakes? Oh, uh, no, I only did one. But it's still such a rookie mistake. Yeah. I mean, this is such a big opportunity. And the fact that I did that, uh, <laughs> she's probably, if you, if you're listening to this, Catherine, she's probably thinking right now, um, it's fine. You don't, you really don't need to worry about it, <laughs> but you know, just, just to throw something out there for the listeners. Why not? Yeah. Director's cut. We know, we know the truth, man. Yeah, well, now you do. <laughs> I could have gotten away with it too. If it wasn't for those pesky kids and that dog. Oh, wow. No, but <laughs> yeah. Well. And how, so how were they, they were nice people, I'm assuming. Oh, incredibly nice. Not even just on camera, but off camera as well. Like when I first met them, they were all smiles. They weren't pushy or anything. Both of them are very nice people and very easy to talk to actually. That's amazing. I'm glad that you, they, they gave us this chance to talk to them about their new album. Yes. And like I said, the new pornographers are a pretty big deal. I mean, they're not. Um, Did they say when that album's coming out? It's called Brilled Bruisers. Brilled Bruisers is just out on the 25th, actually. Of August. So get that on yep. iTunes. Or you stream can. it from Spotify. You can. And actually, I will be reviewing it. Um, I've been given a, a very early copy. I'm not leaking it. I'm not Ooh, doing it. Like a physical one? Vinyl or CD? No, digital. Ooh, but okay. um, I'm not going to leak it, obviously. But... Well, that's um, interesting because even I don't have it, so it's only for you. That's great. That's interesting. Exactly. <laughs> it's pretty good so far, actually. I'm I'm really into it so far, actually. Oh, okay. So I guess the embargo is for the 25th then. Yep, I'm not touching it. I'm not pulling any risks. Sorry, yeah. guys. No, that's fine. <laughs> we'll wait. We'll wait patiently. There'll be but other stuff in between. But we, yeah, we can't wait for that review. It. It'll be well worth it, I think. All right, Andreas. Where can all of our listeners find you? You can find me on Twitter at Andreas Babs. You can find myself at Sean Chin. You can find this show at Live and Limbo on Twitter and use the hashtag Capsule Podcast to join in on the conversation. Please subscribe to this show on iTunes. And of course, you can find the show notes at liveandlimbo.com slash capsule. Take care. Have a good one.
Wait, so in the actual video, it's set, you say Karen or you say Catherine? I say Catherine. I, I did another take. Okay, but, yeah, good. that's um, good. No, it was before. I uh, didn't even notice that either. I was like, when you said that, I'm like, what? I have to watch that again. <laughs> no, I don't think that it's included in the video, but... That's good. Um, oh, I w- the whole time, I was just kicking myself in the face. So I was like, damn it, man. I was so angry. But like after it, she Imagine was like, Imagine if no. you interviewed like Radiohead and you called Tom York like Steve. I'm like, oh, shit. No, <laughs> like, I, I'm pretty sure people have called him Tom York before, right? Steve York. Ah, oh, shit. I mean, Tom York. <laughs> you bloody wanker. Get out of here. <laughs> you fucking idiot. <laughs> no, but um, I'm pretty sure people have called him Tom before. There's no way they haven't. Tom York. 